church and welcome to worship. It's so good to see you all here, those who are present, those who are online. I want to welcome you to worship this morning. It is the ninth Sunday after Pentecost and we are so grateful that you are here. And before I get any further into the announcements, I want to invite Carla to come forward and share some good news. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be announcing that we are starting choir again for the first time since March uh, 2020. So that's really exciting. <laughs> um, our first practice will be held on August 4th at 6.30 following the Wednesday night meal and worship service. I want to invite anyone that has sang in the choir before as well as those who feel called to share their voices with us on Sunday mornings to come to our first choir practice August 4th. If you are uncertain of your voice part, I will be available that Wednesday at 5.30 to place people in the correct voice section. Um, we will be continuing to follow CDC guidelines, so as of today, masks are optional for those who are fully vaccinated, but I am wanting to encourage everyone to consider wearing a mask. As we know, choir is one of the most dangerous activities to participate with this respiratory virus passing around. I will be wearing a mask, so... Um, uh, I would like everybody to join me if you're comfortable. We do have a few different mask options to help overcome the difficulties that come with singing in a mask should you choose that route. So please ask me about those options if you're interested. But other than that, thank you for your time this morning, and I look forward to hearing y'all's voices on August 4th. Amen. I am excited that choir is going to start rehearsing again. And for those of you who were here I, and heard our vocalist last week, Keith, he had three cups. He had a cup of hot tea to warm up the vocal cords. He had a cup of cool water to clear his throat. And then he had another cup that was full of water and he had a straw and he was just blowing into it. He was blowing bubbles. I said, Keith, what are you doing? He said, my vocal coach told me this is how you warm up your vocal cords for singing. So I want you all to go home now and start blowing bubbles in your beverage. So you can start getting warmed up. Choir is going to resume practicing soon. And that is wonderful. Um, many of you ask for, uh, from time to time, what's the mission of the month? Uh, this is July, which is Disciples' Choice Month, which means you may give as you feel called. Uh, what you will want to do when you write your check out and put it in the box, however, uh, is to, um, on the memo line, indicate which mission it is that you would like for your gift to support. If you don't have a preference, you can simply put missions. They will call Allison, and she might be able to help in that direction. I want to talk a little bit about Wednesday night and our summer suppers. They have gone over so very well, and we are so grateful that so many of you have been part of that. On Wednesday nights, we have anywhere from 50 to 80 people coming in. Uh, this coming Sunday, Bob and Lenny and I will be grilling the notes say delicious hot dogs and hamburgers, not just hot dogs and hamburgers, delicious hamburgers and hot dogs. So come Wednesday, uh, 5 o'clock, plan to come and join us. Uh, it's always good. Every week is different. We always have people who come to visit. We always have people who want to come and find out what it is that's going on at UCUMC. And when they come one and two and three households at a time, young families included. It gives us a chance to visit with them and for us to get to know them and them uh, to get to know us. So I want to uh, put that back in the forefront of your thinking. Uh, we also have a sign-up sheet in the Narthex for those of you who might want to sign up uh, and be part of the hospitality team. Our Family Life Ministry focus in July is going to be the Universal City Animal Shelter. So we still have a few of the blessing bags, which are those bags you can keep in your vehicle as you drive around. If you see somebody who might need a bottle of water, a little protein, uh, a, you know, a, a clean pair of socks, uh, they're right there and, and you might hand that off to them. We are also using that same bin now to uh, collect items that will go to the animal shelter. Uh, they will be blessed uh, after uh, being received this week, and then they will be taken, taken to the shelter and put to good use. There is a how you can help list in the Narthex right now if you're wondering what kind of items uh, might be useful. I want to let you all know that August 5 through 7, that's coming up, uh, the Fellowship Hall will be closed to all activities so that we can do a good deep cleaning uh, of our floors especially. 
And I also want to let you know, as we get ready for the coming school years, KDO and preschool, last year uh, the teachers put together these wonderful little apples and then they wrote their wishes on them, Kleenex and markers and Clorox wipes, which were pretty hard to find last year, but you all managed. And uh, we're gonna have a tree out in the narthex and again with little apples and envelopes so that you might um, take an apple and find out how to gift the preschool with gift card or whatever they use those gifts throughout the year. They were a blessing. So keep your eyes open for that. August 8th will be our annual blessing of the backpacks. Backpacks, lunch boxes, diaper bags, whatever it is that is part of the household you're attached to that is part of getting ready for the school year, bring those on August 8th and they will be blessed. God's blessing upon them in the coming year. Ah, and as we get back to school time also, Family Life Ministry wants for you to mark your calendar for another date, August 14th. That's a Saturday morning. I am going to be in the kitchen preparing a hearty breakfast. A hearty breakfast to me means it's going to be hot and there's going to be meat, bacon, sausage, or something. And, uh, and so we're going to have a, a working hands breakfast. Uh, we are inviting the families from preschool and KDO to come out and join us. I would like for the UCUMC family to be there also. We're going to spend about four hours Saturday morning power washing, getting the toys ready, cleaning up the, um, the playground, spreading the sand. So please come and be part of that. It's going to be a good time. It's an opportunity for also to meet some of the families who will be on our campus in the coming year. We will have the nursery open. So that means if, if you or will have your grandchildren or children with you, there will be a place for them to be uh, and supervised while we are doing the work outside. Uh, next announcement is one of those. It's a, it's a celebration uh, with a little bit of, of sadness attached. August 15th on Sunday, uh, we will at the 11 o'clock service at this service uh, being um, appreciating our Preschool director, uh, Marcy Kirkosa, the kids and the families call her Miss K. Miss K, a uh, member of our family, took over leadership um, <clears throat> after Cheryl's retirement as the preschool director. And, and what I believe is true is she was just the right person. It's been a short tenure. She was the right person at the right time. And she now is going on to uh, teach at Randolph Elementary. Uh, school is a great opportunity for her. It is a dream come true. So we want to celebrate her and thank her on the 15th. There are note cards out in the North Ox X. You can uh, write a note and put it in the box. We'll have some cake and punch and celebrate. So please be aware. Also, you will want to watch for August 28th. The United Methodist Women will be having their affordable boutique. If you've been in our fellowship hall, you've seen some of the items hanging up already so that you can see, uh, get a taste of what is going to be available. And Wednesday nights, I am told, they'll put things up for display and they usually get sold. So you, you don't want to miss, you don't want to miss Wednesday nights and you don't want to miss the affordable boutique on the 28th, which will help to support uh, the work of United Methodist Women. That's a lot of announcements, yes? Yeah, that's a lot of announcements, but I will tell you this church, what you have been hearing in this rambling through my announcement list is the life of this faith community. It is the work of the church that is going on throughout the week and throughout the month. And what a very sad thing it would be if announcements were over and done very quickly, amen? Amen. Finally, if you have a prayer concern and if you desire a deeper connection with this faith community, if you wish a call from the pastor, myself, or any member of our care team, please contact the church office. And if you know someone who is looking for a faith connection, please help us with that. Invite them to church. Invite them in line. Because we live at Universal City UMC to serve, love, and to grow. And so now, church, won't you stand and mingle with one another and offer the love and grace of Jesus Christ in worship?
And now, if you will, church, please start moving back to your seats so that we might prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Please join me in our call to worship. Rejoice, folks. Jesus is in our midst. Be glad, friends. Jesus has bread and fish to spare. Sing for joy, people of God. God gathers up the pieces of our lives that nothing may be lost. Thanks be to God. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life. An atonement for sin, an open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. All come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And 
Amen. It is time now for joys and concerns. Already this morning, just in between services, I have heard two praise reports, which are not mine to announce at this time, but your prayers are being answered and healing is happening. I also want to offer that Becky Painter's daughter-in-law, Cheryl, is now scheduled to see a neurologist on August 19th. This is good news. We want to continue to lift Cheryl and her family in our prayers and ask that there will be healing for her also. I want to uh, remind everybody, Kim Buck has been with us this summer and that has been a joy and she's been able to do some important work in finishing up her master's degree requirements and visiting her family and she has also been very busy on Sundays touring around different churches and telling others about the ministry that they are doing in Russia. And on Wednesday, I want you to mark your calendars, Wednesday the 4th of August. Uh, she and um, a husband-wife missionary team from Russia will be with her at our Wednesday night dinner. And that will be an opportunity for them to share some of the good news of what they are doing and that will give you a chance to have one-on-one -on -one and ask questions and also maybe give Kim a big hug because she is getting ready to go back to Russia at the end of the month. So we will continue to lift Kim and her colleagues and their ministry in our prayers. We have concerns this morning. Lori Gold uh, has, um, was in the hospital. She has been returned uh, to Heritage Rehab on Eisenhower, and uh, she has uh, entered into hospice. So um, you all have been lifting her and carrying her in your prayers and ministering to her uh, through her very long and winding road. Uh, I did have a chance to see her the other day. She's looking beautiful and at peace and was watching movies on Netflix when I, I came into her room, and she uh, she ask that we give her a little bit of time to settle in. She does have family who's coming in from out of town to visit, and things will be a little bit busy for a while. But she asks for your continued prayers and note cards and, yes, visits. So we lift Lori in our prayer. Tanya Hammond is scheduled for surgery tomorrow morning to remove a malignant tumor from her liver. We pray that her surgery will, um, and her recovery will be complete. Yvonne Foster's friend, Jamie, who has been suffering for a long time from the chemo medication, 
Uh, she will need a biopsy, so we ask for prayers. And then this morning, quite unexpectedly, uh, Maria Gaetan, who is our nursery coordinator and who was going to be leading Children's Church, um, called earlier this morning to let her coworkers know uh, that she is um, having emergency surgery this morning. She's had health issues for a very long time. So we lift Maria in our prayers this morning also. And now let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we do give you thanks that in every moment of our life, in every moment of the history of the world, you are with us, that you are present, that you walk alongside us, that you carry us, and that you have given to us your church, the vocation of prayer, that we might also reach and touch other lives in powerful ways. And so it is in this confidence that we lift our petitions this morning. We lift prayers, our brothers and sisters, for those who are needing healing this morning. We ask your hand to be upon them. We ask that you pour your spirit out. We ask that you give them that peace that passes all understanding, that they might be aware powerfully of your presence with them in the journey that they are making. We pray for those who are preparing to come home, Lord. We ask also that they will be attending to the sacred moments, the messages you will be sending, that their exit from this life and into the next will be a blessing for them and those who were around them, that it will be a witness to your love and our fellowship. We ask for all of creation, Lord, and the world of which we are aware. We ask that there will be a just and lasting peace. We ask that those who struggle against poverty, who live in war, who suffer oppression, who live in fear, Lord, that your church might rise up boldly to be your presence, those who we are called to be. We pray for those who lead, that they will lead with compassion, with justice, with mercy, with empathy. We pray for the Olympic Games. We understand the nature of the competition and we remember the aspiration of the Olympic Games was that it would bring the world together and we ask that it will do so. We pray for our country. We pray for our community. We pray that you will continue to pour your spirit out upon our faith family, upon this congregation, that you will continue to shine your light, that we might simply take each next step in accordance with your will. We desire nothing other than your will. We pray, Lord, that you will remind us that the gift we have to offer you is ourselves and that we are enough just as we are, and that you walk with us and your blessings will help us to be what you would have us be. Help us to walk in this trust. Help us to walk in this faith. And I pray your blessing on each person who is gathered here this day in presence and online. Reach out your hand, touch, gather us together. For we ask it in the name of the one who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
This morning's gospel lesson comes from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, and I will be reading from the New International Version. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they, be, will they go among so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down, about 5,000 men. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Several weeks ago, Pastor Cynthia asked me if I would be willing to preach today, to which I told her, sure. At the time, I asked her if there was a particular sermon series that she would be working on, and if she wanted me to follow that particular train of thought. She said no, and that I should simply follow the leadings of the Holy Spirit. Well, after thinking and praying about the topic for today, nothing particular came to mind, so I decided to turn to the trusted lectionary for inspiration. Today's lectionary scripture, I am sure, is truly one of the most familiar stories in the Bible. One of the reasons for this is that it tells the story of one of only two miracles Jesus performed that is found in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000 and the second miracle being the story of the resurrection. Well, after looking through my files, I came to a rapid and surprising conclusion. And that was that in all the many years I've been blessed to bring God's word before God's people, I have never had the privilege to preach on this particular scripture. Well, maybe this scripture didn't actually come before me by coincidence. Gee, do you think that maybe God had something to do with it? Let's hope and pray that I do the subject and the Lord proud. If you would please pray with me. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be an acceptable sacrifice in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Sometimes the growth of faith occurs during sickness, such as when Jarius' daughter became sick and passed away, and the Lord subsequently raised her from the dead. I couldn't imagine the pain that Jarius felt as his daughter became sick and died. Sometimes our faith grows when we witness a miracle happening, such as the disciples witnessing the young boy with the mute spirit being healed in Mark 9. As the father cried out, Jesus, I do believe, help me with my unbelief, the young boy was soon healed and the disciples' faith grew as they learned more about praying and fasting. Sometimes our faith grows when we are led into trials and have to suffer and overcome. Peter wrote to the persecuted saints in Rome in 1 Peter verse 7 that, quote, grief, suffering, and trials refine their faith to be greater than gold. Sometimes our faith grows when we feel that we are down to the end of the line, like the widow who related in 1 Kings 17 that she had enough flour and oil left to make a meal for her and her son, and then she planned to die. 
Instead, she shared it with the prophet Elijah and saw her supplies never run dry. Sometimes our faith grows because of an act of nature which took place, such as when God used Moses to part the Red Sea in Exodus 14. God can often expose himself through the power of nature in a way that falls outside the typical parameters that nature has established. And then sometimes, sometimes God calls us to examine our faith by placing a puzzle before us and then providing an answer to that puzzle in the most unexpected of ways. This is the lesson that we learn from today's scripture. This morning's scripture passage is an excellent example of what can happen and how things can be used when we place them in God's hands. The scene is a grassy meadow near Bethsaida by the sea. Jesus had been preaching and healing the sick much of that day. He'd retreated in order to get some rest and recharge his batteries, but when he looks up, he sees the crowd has followed him. He turns to Philip, because this is Philip's old stomping ground, and he says, where can we buy bread for these people? Somewhat confused that Jesus wouldn't recognize an obvious problem, Philip replies, don't you understand that it would take more than eight months of wages to buy bread for all these people? He knew that Jesus was kind and thoughtful, but even for Jesus, this was way out there. Well, all of a sudden, Andrew shows up. Hey guys, there's a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. In the movie, The Wizard of Oz, as the narrative winds down, every step of the way down the yellow brick road, Dorothy grows larger and larger, while the seemingly powerful adults around her grow smaller and smaller. Finally, the curtain falls away, and she learns what all children eventually learn, that adults can be very good persons, but they're very bad wizards. The Wicked Witch of the West sums up their impotence. Who would have thought that a good little girl like you could destroy my wickedness? And as she melts away, Dorothy grows up. Well, the same thing happens in our scripture this morning. The big adult disciples melt into a puddle while a little boy grows up into a giant of the faith. Have you ever wondered what it must have been like for that little boy when he got up that morning who was probably planning to spend the day fishing or playing with his friends? As he's on his way out the door, his mother hollers at him, did you pack a lunch? Ah, mom, get right back in here now, young man. You know you can't be out all day and not have anything to eat. You just sit right down there while I make you some lunch. So she pulls out a little lunch basket and prepares him a lunch of five loaves and two fish. These loaves of bread were not your top of the line sourdough loaves, they were barley loaves, which was the cheapest of all breads. This type of bread at that time was almost cracker-like. Several loaves would be eaten in one meal. Well, his fish wasn't salmon or tuna. The best way to describe these fish were, they were sardines. Now. I know the text says the boy had five barley loaves and two fish, but to help the significance of this miracle stick in your mind, I want to ask you to imagine that the barley loaves and the fish had been put together so that what, in essence, the boy had in his lunch basket was a sardine sandwich. Well, on his way to meet his buddies, he sees a large crowd gathering, and he asks, what's going on? See that guy up there? That's Jesus of Nazareth. He's an incredible teacher, and he can heal people. We all want to hear him preach and see him heal people. Intrigued, the young boy forgets about meeting up with his friends, and he begins to listen to Jesus preach. He becomes enthralled with his teachings about the kingdom of God and about love and forgiveness. And he can hardly contain himself as Jesus makes the blind see and enables the lame to walk. He ends up spending the whole day listening to Jesus, and when Jesus retreats, he joins the crowd and follows him. It's getting late in the day, and as they stand in a large group in front of Jesus, the disciples start to walk through the crowd. The boy feels a tug on his arm and turns around 
to hear Andrew ask him, What's that you have there? Oh, nothing, just a snack. Come here, let me see. Well, after looking inside the basket, he says, Come with me. The little boy can hardly contain himself as he walks with Andrew to the very front of the crowd where Jesus is sitting. He's excited yet shy. As Andrew says, Jesus, this young boy has five barley loaves and two fish. The boy watches in amazement as Jesus takes his lunch, his stinky old unappreciated barley loaves and sardines, and turns them into lunch for 5,000 people. He can hardly wait to get home and tell his mother what happened. But what would he tell her? What's the significance of Jesus taking five barley loaves and two fish and feeding 5,000 people? The significance is that it illustrates for us what can happen when we place ourselves in the hands of God. Jesus knew before Philip asked him that there was a need for food and there wasn't enough food to meet that need. God didn't expect the boy or anyone else for that matter to have enough to feed 5,000. Jesus only expected the boy to place the food in his hands and then leave the rest up to him. You want to know why? Because God's work done God's way never lacks God's supply. You know, we sometimes get caught up in wanting God to be like a genie where we get something for nothing. God wants us to be invested. He wants our hearts to be a part of the solution. He wants our faith in him to come alive. Looking at this in a simple format, the Bible communicates that there are three indicators to our faith becoming alive. Number one, we can put our time in God's hands. Number two, we can put our talent in God's hands. And finally, number three, we can put our treasure in God's hands. I think most of us understand this pretty quickly. Our most valued possessions are our time, our talent, and our treasure. But this story isn't highlighting those. Sure, it mentions the bread and fish, but I don't believe that to be the crux of the story. The point of this story is a lesson for us. God does not ask us to take care of the world with what we have. He asks us to give what we have and let him multiply it to make the difference. Let me give you a snapshot. When we give our time, talent, and treasure to God, we'll often face our unbelief. Let's just expose the reality right here off the bat. When we start living our lives with God at the center, there will be a moment or circumstances that will make us wonder, what can God do with this? We'll look at our time, we'll look at our talent, we'll look at our treasure, and our belief in God will face opposition. The fact of the matter is, we may be our own opposition. Look at Philip's words in verse 7. Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Philip used an absurd example of using eight months of pay to feed people one bite of food each. The idea of feeding a crowd that size was absurd to Philip. And I'm sure he wasn't the only one thinking that. Look at it this way. Philip had already seen Jesus turn water into wine. Heal a young boy who, has, who was in a different town. Heal a blind, lame, and paralyzed man who'd been that way for 38 years. All that, and Philip didn't think that Jesus could make a large meal happen with five pieces of bread and two fish. Now, don't get too down on Philip. Have you ever started with the negative? Well, I know I personally have never done that. I'm cringing as that woman down there is looking at me. She often refers to me as half-empty Bob. Have you ever declined an opportunity before the opportunity ever came, simply because you didn't think it was possible? Have you ever declined a miracle because you or someone thought it was impossible? If we give in to our doubts or the doubts of others, we might be refusing miracles in the lives of thousands of people. Unfortunately, I think we're all guilty. I believe each one of us has had at least one moment where we simply think, didn't think that God would do anything. 
Well, let me encourage you to think in the opposite direction. Expect God to be capable of the impossible. Here's his take on what you and I think is impossible. In Matthew 19, verse 26, Jesus looked at them and said, quote, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. There is the story I mentioned earlier in March, Mark 9, verses 21 through 23, where a young boy was demon-possessed. So his father brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at the father and said, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. So what do you do with, when you have your unbelief? The Father says a great thing to Jesus, a statement which I mentioned earlier, which bears repeating and which I encourage you to memorize. Mark 9, verse 24. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. You know, it's easy to get discouraged when our resources are inadequate, but God is at work in our lives, especially in the midst of doubt and fear. Do not miss what Jesus is doing in this story. He brings his disciples through this living parable and careful questions to the point where they must confess that the resources they have are incomparably small compared to the need which faces them. Every one of us here has already come to that point in our lives or soon will. You begin your marriage thinking that you could live in harmony and peace you would give your spouse what they wanted and get the good you deserved, but your resources are inadequate for the demands of living. You thought you could raise your children to be self-sufficient, happy, self-confident, and safe, but try as you might, your resources are incomparably small compared to the needs which parenting demands. The emotional stress of life. You thought you were strong and stable and can handle the pressure but circumstances have brought you to the end of your rope. Maybe it is spiritually that you have discovered your inadequacies. You wonder what you're living for. What is my purpose? The questions are too hard. The only rest seems to come from remaining so busy that you do not have to think. Even if you have not felt it yet, it will catch you. Age will steal the illusion of self-sufficiency if nothing else will. You may feel strong and invincible today, but we will all be brought face to face with our limits. We will soon arrive at a place where we will not be able to fix the problems, the place where our resources cannot suffice. Jesus exposes the truth to the disciples, not to hurt or to be cruel, but because Jesus' ministry is different from the way we sometimes counsel, preach, or evangelize. He cuts only to heal, for he is the good shepherd. His powerful provision begins only when we recognize our limits. In fact, God provides for every need when we place our inadequacies in his hands. We say, it's impossible, God. God says, what is impossible with men is possible with God. We say, I'm too tired. God says, I will give you rest. We say, nobody really loves me. God says, I love you. We say, I can't go on. God says, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. We say, I can't figure things out. God says, I will direct your steps. We say, I can't do it. God says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. We say, it's not worth it. God says, I am working all things together for good. We say, I can't forgive myself. God says, I forgive you. We say, I can't manage. God says, I will supply every need according to my riches in glory. We say, I'm afraid. God says, fear not, I am with you. We say, I'm worried. God says, cast all your anxieties on me, for I care for you. We say, I'm not smart enough, and God says, I give you the wisdom of my son, Jesus, 
and his righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We say, I feel alone. And God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you have trouble believing sometimes? Ask God to help you with your unbelief. When you start handing over your time, talent, and treasure to God, you'll have opposition. The key is to not let your doubts or the doubts of others stop you from believing that God can turn two fish and five loaves of bread into a filling meal for 5,000 people. When the math doesn't make sense, here's something that might help you see God. We'll call it God's math. Five plus two times God equals food for 5,000. As opposed to Satan's math, five plus two divided by Satan equals food for one boy. Our God likes multiplication. Satan likes division. Don't let your doubts or the doubts of others stop you from believing that God can do the impossible. When you give your time, your talent, and your treasure to God, you'll see miracles happen, and miracles impact people. Our challenge is to not overlook them. The resources for a miracle are always present. God didn't ask us to take care of the world with what we have. He asked us to give what we have and let him multiply it to make a difference. What do you have that if you put it into God's hands would allow miracles to happen? Your job, your children, your marriage, your uncertainty. The challenge for each of us is to see life through the eyes of a child. Only then can we watch God's multiplication provide miracles the miracles that are so desperately needed. I pray that we will each have that childlike faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Bob. What I heard in the hearing of this very familiar story again for the first time is that our lives just as we are multiplied by God equals miracle won't you stand please as we join our voices together in our affirmation of faith I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And you may be seated. It is time now for us to give to God what we have. We will not be passing the plates. There are baskets that remain in the back of the sanctuary where you may place your gift. There are offering envelopes located on the back table if you wish to put an offering of cash in the envelope. You may also give by text messaging UC UMCTX numbers 73256. You may give online through Realm. You may click the Give Online button on our church website. You may use your bank bill pay service, or you may put a check in the mail. God will receive. God will bless. God will magnify. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do give you thanks that we are sufficient just as we are, and that you love us along and grow us. And so we ask that you will receive our offering this day, our offering of prayer, our offering of presence, our giving this day, our service every day, and our witness as we tell the world of the love of God we know through your Son, Jesus Christ. Receive these, then, our offerings. Bless them and magnify them in accordance with your will for the restoration of the world. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.
Now receive these words of benediction. Go forth into the world on this day, blessed to be a blessing, secure in the knowledge that even the smallest gift that you give God can be turned into a miracle. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.